we are abolitionists, God, because we are followers of your son, and we seek to glorify him and and to follow him, and we pray that this conference, Lord, would would uh, further that, and that, Lord, it would, your will would be done. I'm a historian, and uh, for this first part, I'm going to talk about the history of abolitionism, where abolitionism came from, and I'm going to make a general argument about what abolitionism is in and of itself, like theologically, spiritually, in time and space, as something that God inspired, not something that man invented. So for those of you guys who uh, you know, have some, leave it there, Stephen, sorry. Some familiar with what abolitionists are, you probably know about abolitionists as those people who fought slavery. You know about it in the American context or the British context. Well, let me tell you, abolitionists are also, uh, if you can read this, revolting characters. They're among you. They're exciting the feelings of the North against the South. That they're causing disunion. They're a seditious group of people. They're opposed by people who want peace, the Union forever, at the bottom of this flyer. So meet at 7 o'clock at the Presbyterian Church in Cannon Street, and we will get together and come up with ways to put down and silence by peaceable means this tool of evil and fanaticism. Who are these abolitionists, and why are they such an outrage? Of course, today, if you go looking online or in print sources, you get various definitions of abolitionist. You can study all you want, but the act of abolishing or the state of being abolished is like one of those definitions that you need the meaning of the word. Um, so it's kind of a tautology. But you'll find principles or measures fostering abolition, especially of slavery. Usually, the definitions of abolitionism will be uh, self-referential. But you'll get something a little more specific. A person who advocated or supported the abolition of slavery. Abolition, uh, abolere, to end. Um, a person in favor. But you see all sorts of things. You get online, look at what about, or um, ask Jeeves. You'll start getting stuff. Good stuff, bad stuff. You'll get stuff that's just really, really good. Whoever wrote this and put this up online was a genius. <clears throat> um, but you'll get Wikipedia. You'll get various explanations of what abolitionism is. And I am not interested in any of them. So I'm going to be speaking from the point of view as someone who has been academically trained in history. And I've learned all the rules, how to do, study things historiography, how we ought to terse things out and explain them in time and history, what their causes are and relations and stuff, anything like that. But I'd like to quote this uh, excellent Catholic. To comprehend the history of a thing is to unlock the mysteries of its present and more to disclose the profundities of its future. I want to know what abolitionism is right now, and what it will be in the future. And that's why I begin with the people who made the word famous. Everyone's seen this symbol, am I not a man and a brother? Abolitionism as an organized social movement begins in the late 18th century in Britain. All right, we're not going to go into it, but you're all probably very, very familiar with the parliamentary struggle to end slavery, beginning with the end of the trade in slaves, British involvement with slavery, um, as far as the actual Atlantic slave trade, stealing men and women, creating the image of God from Africa, and then putting them to work in the sugar fields, cotton plantations, um, using them like beasts and stealing them. The central focal point of discussions of abolition are usually centered on William Wilberforce. 
William Wilberforce is basically credited, like if you look up abolition, it'll say, example, William Wilberforce. If you look up encyclopedias, it'll say, led by William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce rightly uh, deserves such attention. Um, he did tirelessly stand up in Parliament fighting for the Slave Trade Act, um, Abolition Act. Um, and, you know, this is, this is not a photograph. Um, and William Wilberforce uh, was neither that pretty nor that pretty. Small shrimp of a man. Nothing beautiful to look at. But many of you have probably seen Amazing Grace detailing the abolition of the slave trade through the life of this one guy. Right? And of course, these guys show up a bit. These guys show up. Equiano, Thomas Clarkson, Henry Thornton, various other abolitionists show up in the movie. But the movie basically centers on the work of William Wilberforce. But Wilberforce was the legislator. He was the guy who was standing up, writing a bill, arguing for it, putting it to a vote, going home depressed. Right? The abolitionists were the people out in the culture, collecting signatures, holding signs, printing up slave ship diagrams, sneaking onto slave ship boats, seeing how the slaves were treated, producing propaganda, telling stories, and basically otherwise being disturbers of the status quo in their culture. A movie about William Wilberforce is not a good way to talk about the abolition of slavery. That's just a free note. It's really impossible to do a movie about all these guys. Maybe we'll do it someday when we get the funding. So among the abolitionists of slavery, you had artists, you had poets, you had preachers, you had politicians, you had just good old normal people. What they determined to do was to put the nation's eye on their practice in this filthy trade in men and abolish it. One of the early things they did was fashion a symbol. They took that symbol of a, of a, of a slave on bended knee beseeching God for help, usually with the phrase, am I not a man and a brother? Sometimes uh, on this uh, collection box, this is a fundraising box, Am I not a sister? They put this on everything. They actually effectively, and this is a quote from a, a, a prestigious historian, just have to take my word for it, Philip Seymour. He actually uh, said that they created such a snobbery against people that weren't for slavery by putting this on everything. So you would try to go and buy like a plate, and you'd be like, well, I'm for slavery. And they were like, sorry, no plate for you. Or, you know, they would, they, they would put them in their gardens. Ladies would wear them as brooches. They were on the backs of snuff boxes for all those respectable snuff uh, users. Um, everywhere. They, they tossed coins to each other. They inundated their culture with this appeal on behalf of their brothers and their fellow creatures of God. Now, when you read about the abolition of slavery, you see that they always talk about those miserable wretches the Africans. And you're like, whoa, that sounds like racist and bad. You know, like William Wilberforce would be like, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking of those miserable wretches and what I did not do for them, I did not do for him. And then you look at the footnote and uh, the author saying like, well, they, were, they considered the Africans the least of these. And they were trying to, uh, to capture it. You're good, Stephen. So they came together in groups. They forged local societies they made themselves visible with the symbol. Uh, they did, uh, you know, do other things. But they made themselves heard. You think it's a modern phenomenon of open-air street preaching? It's not. This was going on. Uh, people would literally take slave ship chains out onto the street corners or in front of, you know, uh, churches and, and shake them and quote Bible verses. That's why that they had to be put down made themselves heard. They produced true propaganda. It is propaganda to like draw some horrible thing and print it in the paper. 
But it was true. Slavery was a horrible thing. They did their research. They knew how many people were dying in the Atlantic slave trade. They knew how many women were being raped. They knew how many people were being thrown overboard because of dysentery. They did the research. They presented the inhumanity of slavery. All of this was done to agitate and arouse the public conscience, disturb the status quo. And at the root of everything they did was this constant declaration that slavery was sin. Not slavery is bad, slavery is an injustice, and slavery is sin. The backbone was it's inconsistent with Christianity. Read through a William Wilberforce speech, always ends, always begins with we call ourselves a Christian nation, and yet. And they worked for its immediate abolition. British people worked for the immediate abolition of the slave trade. Slavery wasn't going on so much around them, but they focused on immediately abolishing the trade in men, the boats going back and forth. They didn't sort of say, well, let's like stop some of the boats, then some of the boats. Let's start with the boats that have the, the lighter skin guys on it, and then let's go to the darker skin or anything like that. They did not create any sort of incrementalism. Brian uh, Biggs will talk about that later. Here's what society called them. Dissenters. I could put quotes around these and give you bit many books, but they wouldn't fit on the airplane. Dissenters, fanatics, saints. They were called saints, but that was derogatory because basically the culture was uh, opposed to Catholicism at the time. And, well, I won't go into it, but it was basically calling them like goody goodies. They were called radicals. This is during the period in which there's a French Revolution going on and France wants to invade Britain and there's all this kind of stuff, so they're considered seditious. Enthusiast was the word that they used for fundamentalist back in the day. So if you believed in things like Jesus dying for your sins and making you no longer a slave to sin, you were enthusiast. Today we use the word fundamentalist. They were called a sect. Uh, William Wilberforce was called a Negro lover and a moral busybody. And they were called insurgents and... There's a lie on this slide. No one really called them abolitionists. They didn't even call themselves abolitionists. They called themselves Christians living in a culture that practiced slavery. None of you can read this, but this is the original charter for the 1787 establishment of the first abolition society in Britain, the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. William Wilberforce was not at this meeting. A bunch of people like us were at this meeting and they later got William Wilberforce involved. The principal guy who gets overlooked, you know that, you know that, has everyone seen Amazing Grace? Can I refer to it pretty, pretty much like you've seen Amazing Grace? You know the guy who, uh, they said, when Fox says, do any of you saints drink? And the guy goes, well, this one does, and he pulls out the flask, Thomas Clarkson, the kind of crazy one. There's no real record that he drinks. I don't know why they put that in the movie. Um, one day I'll ask Eric Metaxas what was up with that, because he was kind of very much a holiness guy, Quaker, evangelical. But Thomas Clarkson, in 1808, somehow managed to come out, I don't know if you can see that, 1808 somehow managed to come out with a two-volume, like 600-page, History of the Rise, Progress, and Accomplishment of the African Slave Trade by British Parliament. And in that book... He defined abolition kind of through the whole thing. But at the one point, the, the only point where you kind of really get like something succinct, is very simple, to undertake the removal of evils. This is different than modern dictionary definitions because it uses the theological word evils and um, is laden with all the context around it. Again, the basic thing. in its nature abhorrent to every just and tender sentiment, contrary to the whole tenor of the gospel. On page 4 and 5, um, Clarkson writes that there has always been, in all times and countries, a counteracting energy which has opposed itself more or less to the crimes and miseries of mankind. 
but it seems to have been reserved for Christianity to increase this energy and to give it the widest possible domain. Um, he waxed way too eloquently to say it was reserved and caused by providence under divine influence. So he defines abolition as the undertaking of removing evils, and then he says, where does that come from? Christianity. Page six, this is what Thomas Clarkson does. And I'm not, you can all look at this. He cites prior abolitionist movements in history to justify what they've done and to explain the particular impulse. He talks of the abolition of the gladiatorial battles where they took prisoners of war and they made them fight, spilling blood. He talks of the abolition of cruel fanaticism, custom, and practices which lead his fellow creature to the altar to sacrifice him to fictitious gods. He's referring to the abolition of infanticide and euthanasia and abortion by the early church. Then he talks, don't want to get too controversial here, about the venerable martyrs who were courageous through their faith and um, rose up to sanctify the church. And then he talks about um, witchcraft. So he talks about some things that, that Christians have abolished. But in whatever way Christianity may have operated towards the increase of this energy or towards a diminution of human misery, it has operated in none more powerful than by the new views and the consequent duties which it introduced on the subject of charity, practical benevolence, and love. I don't know if any of you guys could follow that. But here's here's his explanation of where abolition comes from. The author of our religion was the first who taught and pronounced the misapplication of slavery to be a crime. He used the word servitude. Servitude to be a crime, and to be a crime of no ordinary dimension. He was the first who broke down the boundary between Jew and Gentile. So who are we talking about? Jesus. And therefore, the first who pointed out to men the inhabitants of their countries and the exercise of love. He goes on, to Christianity alone, we are indebted for the new and sublime spectacle of seeing men go beyond the bounds of individual usefulness to each other, of seeing them associate, seeing men associate, this is men and women, this is 1808, uh, associate for the extirpation of private and public misery. Another definition, for the removal of private and public misery, and of seeing them carry their charity as a united brotherhood. So where does abolition come from from for Thomas Clarkson? It comes from people who follow Christ. The crux of the argument about why slavery is wrong was not because it was ugly. It was not because it was economically, like the Marxist historians say, no longer beneficial. It was contrary to the whole gospel. Read pages 115 through 127 of the Rise, Progress, and Coalition of the Abolition of the Slave Trade, and you will see this. The coins, the am I not a man and a brother symbol, going to get into a tizzy, was not in any way, shape, or form a graphic image. It was a theological image. It was a romantic image. If I was speaking, to, it was from it was romantic. It was created, yes, to sort of be emotive. But on the back sides of these coins, you always have the golden rule. You'll have Matthew 25 about the least of these. You'll have simply love your neighbor. You have variations of biblical scripture on the backs of these coins, always associated with the symbol. The fight against ab- the the slave trade was never divorced from the gospel or the biblical text, or Christianity. In fact, if we were going to be doing a different talk, you will actually find William Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, um, Equiano, you will find these guys arguing against the Thomas Paines and so on and so forth, the secular people who told them to leave Christianity out of it because that would be more pragmatic. So yes, they used graphic images. They did. The slave ship was a graphic image. Some of those things with the, you know, pictures and drawings of what they what they did. Pictures they would they would have. This is before um, common use of the foot, um, 
the camera, they would actually draw pictures of slaves being whipped, so on and so forth, and, and leave it to the imagination. They used graphic images, but that was not the sole and important thing to them. The use of graphic images alone would not allow people to put the symbol on themselves and turn the culture upside down. I'll return back to Wilberforce and just go very quickly on him. At the height of the abolition of the slave trade, um, he wrote a book. Was his, he wrote a book early on about abolishing slavery, but he wrote a book at the height after um, discouragement and so on and so forth, a practical view of the prevailing religious system of professed Christians in the high and middle classes in this country contrasted with real Christianity. William Wilberforce, that we all love and admire as the abolition of slavery, was writing books about how all the churches were full of apathetic people who were doing nothing that was at all like true Christianity. If you read, that's still a good book, by the way, if y'all want to read it for, for spiritual reasons. But this is what he did. He fought slavery, they kept on losing, and he said, why? He said, well, it's because everyone's addicted to the rum and the tea and all the things that are produced by slavery. And then when he looked at the church, he said, and they don't care about it. And he put one, one together. Um, his argument was that we needed to destroy nominal Christianity and replace it with vital Christianity. And many, many quotes from William Wilberforce, one of the most favorite and frequently used one that we do is the private faith that does not act in the face of oppression is no faith of all. Faith without works is dead. Dead orthodoxy. You can know if your orthodoxy is alive or not by your orthopraxy. If you take no action against oppression, you are um, you don't actually have the faith that you claim. Jesus would say to you, I do not know you. Wilberforce was alive to the sufferings of his fellow creatures. And we'll just go on. So they abolished the slave trade in 1807. They abolished it, and 1807 celebrated it. There was a problem with how long they took, and there was a problem with just abolishing the trade. Because slavery remained legal in this one particularly large slave trading colony that they lost a war to <laughs> previously. So this is my definition of abolitionism according to the history of, of abolition. It's the correction of oppression, the alleviation of social ills, the reformation of manners, uh, morals, the removal of evils as a result of cultivating vital Christianity, destroying nominal Christianity, and denying the flesh in pursuit of loving and living for others. Back to where I was. America. Slavery wasn't just going on on ships and benefiting our economy. In America, you saw it. You benefited from it. It was all around you. In the streets, you saw, you saw it was a regular part of your life to see black people treated like animals and property. Even if they were treated respectively, they were owned. The picture back there was an auction block. I haven't done the historical paper on this, and I probably never will, but someone ought to. The primary thing listed over and over and over and over again by the American abolitionists of slavery was the fact that slavery was a system that destroyed the family. The phrase, sell you down the river, I don't know if you ever use that with your kids. Don't. That's really bad. That's like, I'm going to sell you down the river, closer to the plantations where it's hottest and they work them to death. Slave lives about four years there. And there's much to be said about the American abolitionists. I would actually recommend, as pretty darn accurate and providentially planned, right after we started you know, reigniting the abolitionist movement in America, uh, who was it that did the American Experience Grant? Who, who produced this video? P PBS or someone like that actually did a four-part, five-part series on the abolitionist, and they got it right. You watch the thing, and if you're an abolitionist and you've been doing the work that is going on in your various abolitionist societies, you'll be like, whoa, experience that, experience that, experience that. So we're back to America. 
attention, Southern men. That first one that said outrage, let's meet together and see what we can do about peace, peaceable means. Peaceable means actually kind of flew out the window pretty quick in America because abolitionists were not like frightened by people going, hey, you know. Uh, attention, Southern men, down with the abolition press. Meet at Schneider's. It's just like this is like, go, those like handbills going out and people are gathering up and meeting to figure out what to do about these incendiaries, these agitators. Um, why? Because you have people standing up in public places. Um, the culture was different then. There were actual places where this was like encouraged, public places, like in this picture, where having anti-slavery meetings in the public sphere, standing up and calling the South a brothel, like on the Mason-Dixon line. We're a little later in, fu- in history, so we've got pictures. You have abolitionist societies. I shouldn't have to describe what these are because you're all in them, and they don't look any different. The only thing that may be different about you guys and us is, is for whatever reason, I know it's like later on in time, but th- we're more bearded than the 19th century abolitionists. I, don't, I said that slavery was contrary to the whole gospel. You were silent. Just pointing it out. Check yourself. Don't make me Paul Wesher you. So you have abolitionist societies. They are engaging in artistic pursuits, documenting the horrors of the slave trade. They're writing poems. They're creating primers. Let's just get through it. Again, their principal concern, the thing that they sort of focus on more than anything, and the most common image outside of the slave on bended knee is a mother having her child ripped away from her. Right? This image is repeated over and over throughout the history of the abolition of slavery. People being sold as cattle and mothers and their children being ripped apart. If you read the Uncle Tom's Cabin, for instance, that's what it's about. Married couple, separated. Child, separated. Uh, over and over and over again. And if you pay attention, most of the slave owners in Uncle Tom's Cabin are good, gentle men who end up having to, you know, separate their people. All right. They use graphic images. Again, with the child. They, they talked about the brutalization of slavery, not just upon the Africans who were under the whip, but actually on the whip holders. They were concerned about what it was doing to the morality of the country. They also mentioned that this was basically turning Africans against Africans, and they, they used to really care about these sorts of things, uh, brotherhood of men and stuff, and so uh, these were Quakers, and they had a really big problem with that. So oftentimes you would hear of slaves mistreating other slaves in order to... to they had anti-slavery meetings. They drew up charters. They did like we did, and they... Uh, basically made everyone else around them uncomfortable. And they didn't actually just fight slavery like once a year or occasionally. Slavery was going on every day in their midst all the time. And so they integrated abolitionism into their life. And then after some time, they grew and grew and grew and they had huge fantastic picnics. Conferences. Um, This is actually later on. I think this is um, after the Emancipation Proclamation. They're celebrating. um, But this is a famous image because it has black people and white people picnicking together as a result. And uh, this church in the back, that's the church um, that William William Lloyd Garrison was uh, removed from or asked to leave. So you could do a whole lecture on that. They published... A periodical. It took them some time to get it out, but it came out on January 1st, 1831, The Liberator. Uh, it was uh, distributed liberally as far as they could. Um, not, not very well funded. Um, we'll get that out. We'll, we'll relaunch it January 1st, I hope. Um, and they made big declarations of the Anti-Slavery Convention. I'll read a little bit of that here in a second. Various ministers did take up the cause. They stomped on slave chains and, you know, and they used the symbol as well. 
And uh, I believe this is a commentary on uh, Matthew from uh, Jonathan Edwards. So this is early, but it was very popular among abolitionists, talking about the injustice of slavery, citing the gospel. They wrote, uh, you know, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, You know, various things, poems, facts. They produced propaganda. They passed them out. Someone might even say that they dropped them. This is a little more expensive back then, so you couldn't just like put them at the gas pump, but uh, they did these things. They also did kind of culty things, like come up with symbols and stuff, stuff like that. Um, they wrote songs, and they uh, produced stories. Chief among them was Uncle Tom's Cabin. They published sermons against slave trade. Their appeal was not, you know, let's end slavery for economic reasons and so on and so forth. They would bring those arguments in. Uh, They would bring in, there were various Enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Paine who said things, like Thomas Jefferson who said things, and they'd try to take what they said and show the hypocrisy of of American um, oppression, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and created equal and all that kind of stuff. They would do that, but... Their basic recruiting cry was that you had a duty to yourselves, the slave, and God. And this duty was so great that it was worth emancipation or dissolution. They were willing, abolitionists of slavery in America were willing to rip the country apart. They talked about it all the time. You know? They, would, they wouldn't just say, no Christian fellowship with slaveholders... They would say, practice church discipline on those slaveholders, and if you don't, there'll be no union with slaveholders. And that's why we have Southern and Northern Baptists. They were so crazy about this that actually they did, the, uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church was the largest church, and they split that church because many, many abolitionists came out of those churches. It was called the Come Outer Movement. They came out of those churches because pastors would either preach only nominally about slavery or say things like it's not a very important issue or various other things. After the arrival of immediatism, and it's too complicated to go into exactly, they left their denominations and started you know, smaller local fellowships, so on and so forth. But they were considered agents of Satan. That is... A really bad drawing of William Lloyd Garrison, or not, not William Lloyd Garrison, Orange Scott is a Methodist minister who was defrocked, getting, getting the message from Lucifer himself, slavery is sin. So the, the devil is telling the abolitionist slavery is sin, and then the African drawn very evilly to look more like an animal than a man uh, looks on, and it's all in the clouds. And it's, it's accusing abolitionism of being anti-church, dividing the church, and so on and so forth. They kept going. They just kept going. Why? That impulse that Clarkson was talking about, Christianity. It was a chaotic time. They were looted. The U.S. government, I can't remember what it is, I think it's like uh, it's, it's like 12 years. It ends in 44. The U.S. government actually stopped post from the north to the south to keep abolitionist literature from, from injuring. So the U.S. Postal Service did that. And it was partially because they, they didn't like the disruption it caused in the south, but it was also basically as a result of the constant looting and destruction of abolitionist materials at post offices. Uh, In that last picture you saw, there was like a reward for Lewis Tappan. This is William Lloyd Garrison being mobbed in the street after giving a lecture, and uh, they tied a noose around his neck, and they wanted to hang him. This is civilized times, and and, uh, we're unlocking the the, uh, future. We're talking about the future. They dragged him through the street, and they wanted to hang him for being an abolitionist. Good luck with that. But the... Garrison was thrown in jail, and he he wrote some interesting things on his jail cell wall. Uh, We'll get to. Go ahead, Stephen. They burned down printing presses and threw them in the Mississippi River, 
and they shot people in the chest. Elijah Lovejoy, namely. Abolitionists, once they made them, after the culture had been softened so much that an abolitionist could actually find himself on the congressional uh, level, uh, speaking up for the abolition of slavery, they got caned, like in the house. Like when next time you're at Washington, D.C., and you're in that fancy building, it's all respectable, where all the politicians pretend like they're doing something today. They actually, uh, I can't remember who Kane Sumner, but uh, they were beating abolitionists on the floors of the highest level of government. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but look at everyone laughing in the background. They pressed on, and as we all know, slavery came to, to an end in the New World William Lloyd Garrison changed, he changed the uh, masthead of the Liberator, and he gave credit to the Liberator by Christianity coming through, separating master and slave, just like in Britain. Christ was glorified in what they did. Now Lincoln is... It's another picture of them celebrating. I just like these pictures of people throwing their hats up and uh, stuff like that. There's lots of abolitionists. Historians debate about who was and who wasn't an abolitionist. North, if you were in the North, were you an abolitionist? No, historians basically reckon that 3% of the North were abolitionists. It's crazy. Like We think of it North versus South, but it was actually 3% of the North were members of some kind of abolitionist society. Historians don't count people who like we're like, yeah, I think slavery shouldn't be expanded into Kansas, whatever, you know. Or they, they don't count, they count them on whether they were in societies, whether they were actively involved uh, in works of benevolence or works of agitation, so on and so forth. But they're abolitionists across the, the, the board. Uh, there are ministers, good old, there are orators, there are people who left, left uh, various... Uh, professional exploits to join abolition. There are, like Frederick Douglass in this picture, uh, runaway slaves who gained their freedom. There are emancipated slaves. There are many, many black abolitionists who are actually sorely um, underrepresented, and they're all awesome, but um, I, should, I should talk about them solely sometime in the future. There's one person on this screen who is not an abolitionist. The one in red. So... This one here, this, this sort of bespectacled guy here, William Lloyd Garrison, he, from about the 1830s on, I think actually in 1827 is the first time you see something like this, but um, he actually, in his speeches, um, their favorite time to like get all the abolitionists together and celebrate um, their agitation was on July 4th, and he did crazy things like burn the Constitution and stuff, because he thought it was hypocritical, which it was, but... William Lloyd Garrison set the world on fire. He said, I have mountains of ice all about me. I have need to be all on fire. And Garrison was hated by all the politicians, all of the ministers. The, the, uh, the only equivalent to LifeChurch.tv at this period was the church that Garrison went to and asked. He was like, hey man, you want to put some money towards like the publication of The Liberator? And the guy's like, man, you know... I support what you're doing, and, and, and I love it that it's your special calling, but eh, you're a little incendiary. Um, now, Garrison, to get back to what I was saying, said this over and over again. There will be blood. If we do not, by moral suasion and the practical application of the principles of our blessed Savior, fight slavery and abolish it, there will be blood. He's constantly saying this over and over and over again. It's in everything he said. There will be blood. There will be blood. If you Christians do not abolish slavery, there will be blood. Lincoln gets credited with emancipating the slaves, right? I I thank God for that last movie because it's very clear that um, there was a lot of politics going on. Um, But I also hate that last movie, and I hate the fact that Lincoln is more known than William Lloyd Garrison because Lincoln was Mitt Romney. But what had happened, this is not controversial, I'm not 
giving you any kind of uh, unsupported historical fact, is the abolitionist had changed the moral and cultural climate so much in regards to slavery, Christianity, those two things being... Uh, the thesis of Uncle Tom's Cabin isn't that slavery is bad. The thesis is slavery is inconsistent with Christianity. They had done so much work in that area that it was impossible to fight a war between the North and the South without abolition being a part of it. And most of the young men who were dying in that battle went to that battle singing songs about John Brown with liberators in their back pockets. And they died to make men free. I don't endorse the interpretation of that scripture, but they said weird things like he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Um, without the um, shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. These guys fought. This is what Lincoln said. Oh, Lincoln hated uh, Garrison. You can, you can basically find this. Uh, Lincoln is a gradualist. He thinks that slavery should be abolished. He was a member and supporter of American colonization. He thought the best way to get rid of slavery is to incrementally get rid of it over time by uh, deportation. He was a racist. He thought black people were made in the image of God, and that was great, but they needed to be back in Liberia or Africa or something like that. Sorry if you are a big admirer of Lincoln. There's much to be admired, but he was a pro... uh, He was a colonizationist. He was an incrementalist, a gradualist. He did not appreciate, and neither did his cabinet, and they all wanted him to ditch his efforts on the 16th Amendment. I actually think that God got a hold of him, and there's a story there that's really interesting about him, Lincoln, repenting. But here's what Lincoln said. The logic and moral power of Garrison and the anti-slavery people of the country and the army have done it all. He, they put the flag back up at Fort Sumner and they invited a bunch of people. And I don't know, I saw this yesterday. It's a photograph of William Lloyd Garrison sitting next to the pastor who removed him from his church, both invited by Lincoln, giving a speech about the end of the Civil War and the emancipation of slaves and the, you know, the, the famous sort of house divided type speeches that he gave. So who were these people? Like, what is the definition of abolitionism? How, how, can, how, can, I, how can I summarize them? Uh, well, abolitionist, this is James McPherson. He's a Pulitzer Prize uh, historian of the Civil War and abolition. This is from the abolitionist legacy. This is basically a standard presentation of who were the abolitionists and who weren't because everyone in the North would consider themselves anti-slavery. The country was split about 50-50, anti-slavery versus, uh, you know, pro-peculiar institution. There are about six main groups within abolition. You had church-oriented abolitionists. You had uh, abolitionists. I can't go into it, but the defining characteristics are those who, before the Civil War, agitated for the immediate, unconditional, and total abolition of slavery in the United States. And historians do not include anti-slavery activists, such as Abraham Lincoln or the Republican Party, which called for the gradual ending of slavery. They don't consider them abolitionists. Why? The immediatist, the people who were fighting slavery, and the people who Lincoln and others credited with changing the culture's mind on it, well, they spent more time fighting the American Colonization Society than they did slavery, which we're going to explain. Who were these fiends of hell? This is Henry Hammond, James Henry Hammond. He's uh, exasperated. Who were the ignorant, infatuated barbarians whose right to petition Slade presumed to defend Who are these foul murderers, bloodhounds, incendiaries, agitators, instigators of midnight murder? These disturbers of our peace and enemies of our lives and liberties. These cold-hearted, base, malignant libelers and calumniators. These knowing accessories to murder, robbery, rape, and infanticide. In short, who are these fiends of hell? 
church women, mostly church women and preachers and Quakers and a few teachers and lawyers and journalists, a powerless and marginal handful of practitioners of a new sort of reform. This is the opening uh, paragraph of Arguing About Slavery by William Lee Miller, and I, and I love it because it's like, who are these? They're inciting murder and rape. Who are they? Church women. If you look at our Facebook stats, most of them, 73% of them are women. And here's the historiography. Beginning in the late 1820s, early 1830s, I'm going to read this quote. Long-time AHA people, pay attention to it, and uh, everyone else be kind of befuddled why this is important. This is 1830s. Quote, A significant number of Americans underwent a kind of moral conversion. The new moral perception was not only that slavery was wrong, many had been saying that for years, but that its wrongness had the highest priority and that the ways its wrongness had been opposed heretofore had been profoundly inadequate. So a significant number of Americans stand up and start saying slavery is wrong, but that's not the thing. It's not that they're anti-slavery or they're pro-emancipation. It's that it is uppermost in priority and that the way it's been being fought for, if you want to do the math, this is in 1830. When was the country founded? 1776. So what's the math? 1776 to 1833. How many years, roughly, are we talking? 57. The first abolitionist society in America started in 1787. It falls away, and the American colonization stuff goes for about 40 years of the anti-slavery campaign in America. So a significant number rises up. The historians basically... uh, often take as the point of departure for the new abolitionism, January 1st, 1831. In 1831, William Lloyd Garrison began publishing things like, I will not go with the multitude to do evil. This is his definition of abolitionism. The nation is full of the blood of innocent men, women, and babies, full of adultery and, I can't ever pronounce, concupiscence, sexual desire and licentiousness, full of blasphemy, darkness, woeful rebellion against God, full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. When William Lloyd Garrison was rounded up, that's from the speech he was giving, And then he got off the stage, and he was like going somewhere else, was rounded up by the mob, he was thrown in jail, and he wrote in his jail cell, are we then fanatics because we cry, do not rob, do not murder? Gets out of jail, and he begins writing these famous things. You see a lot of people quote this. I'm going to read it in full, because we are, after all, naming our conference after a quote from William Lloyd Garrison. I will be as harsh as truth. This is from the first issue of the Liberator. And as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen, but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. The apathy of the people is enough to make every statue leap from its pedestal and to hasten the resurrection of the dead. I desire to thank God that he enables me to disregard the fear of man which bringeth a snare and to speak his truth in its simplicity and power. And here I close with this fresh dedication. And he wrote a poem. Fire. You see this quote. 
I saw this quote, I think, appear on a meme on the internet, and it usually starts out, I will be as harsh as truth, as uncompromising as justice on the subject, I, and then you, you leave out all these arguments against moderation and gradualism, um, and so on and so forth, and then it ends with the I will not excuse, I will not retreat. So William Wilberforce, or, uh, I always do that, William Lloyd Garrison, sets out to establish um, the American Anti-Slavery Society, and he sets it up in contradistinction and opposition to the American Colonization Society. <laughs> but he sets it up in opposition to the anti-slavery movement of his time. The Declaration, which is too long for me to read, makes arguments similar, you know, about not going down to Pharaoh. They're not going to wait in the shadow of Egypt on the politicians. They're not going to this and that. They're rejecting colonization. They, they consider it cruel and delusive to, like, set emancipation dates. There were, like, manumission uh, dates that went into, like, the 1900s that the anti-slavery people were setting. Like, we'll abolish slavery gradually, and we'll see an ultimate end to it in, like, 1909. So, he, he's against all those things, and these are the views. Remember, we're trying to figure out what is abolitionism. This is the Declaration of the American Anti-Slavery Society. These are our views and principles. These are designs and measures with entire confidence in the overruling justice of God. Just remember these things because we're going to be here a long time. Overruling justice of God. We plant ourselves upon the declaration of our independence and upon the truths of divine revelation as upon everlasting rock. We shall organize anti-slavery societies, if possible, in every city, town, and village of our land. We shall send forth agents to lift up the voice of remonstrance, of warning, of entreaty, and rebuke. We shall circulate unsparingly and extensively anti-slavery tracts and periodicals. I love the unsparingly and extensively because that's like the language I want to use when someone's like, don't be dropping these cards. We shall circulate anti-slavery tracts and periodicals. We shall enlist the pulpit, one, and the press, two, and the cause of the suffering and the dumb. Uh, Matthew 25. We shall aim at a purification of the churches from all participation in the guilt of slavery. From all participation in it. Slavery, anti-slavery apathy, all participation. We shall encourage the labor of free men over that of slaves by giving a preference to their productions. <laughs> there was a practical thing in there. We shall spare no exertions nor means to bring the whole nation to speedy repentance. This is their declaration that the nation must repent and that they're going to do everything they can to get the nation to repent. This is what they're declaring. And this is what they say. This is how the declaration ends. Our trust for victory is solely in God. We may be personally defeated, but our principles never. Truth, justice, reason, humanity must and will gloriously triumph. Already a host, this is in 1831, already, so this is two years into his thinking on the subject, already a host is coming up to help of the Lord against the mighty, and the prospect before us is full of encouragement. Submitting this declaration to the candid examination of all the people there, pledging ourselves that under the guidance and by the help of Almighty God, we will do all that is in us to overthrow the most execrable system of slavery that has ever been witnessed upon the earth. And he did it. The creed of the abolitionists of slavery was that it was sin and that abolition was repentance. Elijah Lovejoy, who is, you can't see it because I put words in front of it. Uh, this is a memorial to him there in, uh, I think, Alton. This is a piece of one of the printing presses that the uh, respectable um, colonization society people threw into the Mississippi. He is known as a martyr of free speech, and he was. But what he was being attacked for was his constant calling slavery sin. He was a preacher who had to leave his post as a preacher. He still preached um, to a local fellowship. But he took up a, a periodical, published against um, 
Well, he was very incendiary. He had a big problem with slavery and um, sort of channeling future Toby Harmon Catholics. But they, you know, in, 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 the, in the area he was, he was not well liked. They told him to stop publishing it, and they threw his stuff in the river, um, and he kept on going. Of course, you know, society, like the British abolitionists, called them agitators, fanatics, radicals, insurrectionists, insurgents, zealots, lovers. That's where this term comes from. I know you've all probably experienced being called fetus lovers before. It's like the other side is clueless to history. Um, they were called that. They were called false prophets. And they were called wolves. Ravaging wolves. Harken back to Satan is the author of the doctrine that slavery is sin and ought to be abolished. What abolitionists called themselves? <laughs> Again with Garrison. What He said, this is after, this is at the end of slavery. He's writing a book called No Compromise with Slavery. And he said, I consider abolition to be the highest expediency, the soundest philosophy, the noblest patriotism, the broadest philanthropy, and the best religion extant. They were, like a, they were kind of cultish, right? But, but you get, what is abolition? It's the cause of Christ. That's what you get. That's, uh, and, uh, that's Sarah Grimke. You get a Christian's duty. It's Fred, Frederick Douglass. A Cross to Bear, Wendell Phillips, Theodore Weld, William Lloyd Garrison, everyone who was subscribing to the Liberator saw abolitionism as a cross to bear. With one hand we clasp the cross of Christ, with the other grasp the neck of the downtrodden slave. Whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. The least of these in their culture were the slaves. Um, And their argument was not slavery is simply bad. The state of slavery in the United States is so totally at variance with, there's a whole lot of language here, but so repugnant to the spirit and design of the Christian religion. Um, This is another, this is an address to Christians Um, that Evan Lewis wrote um, before he was removed from his um, orthodox Bible-believing church. So what is abolitionism? Refusing to go with the multitude to do or complacently allow evil. To repent and remove yourself from doing evil. Most of the abolitionists were repenting the leaders were either repenting of being slaveholders themselves, being in the system, whether you're talking about uh, the Grimkes or the Tappans, and being involved in the ec- economics or actually being slave owners themselves, James Burney, for instance. But they consider themselves repenting of slavery and now they're abolitionists. The rest of them were repenting of their involvement in colonization, which they believe to be the thing which they had to put an end to if they were ever going to put an end to slavery. Um, so they, they were repenting of their apathy, complacency, and they decided they were not just going to abstain from slavery. You know, the meme could be, don't like slavery, don't own a slave. They were not just abstaining from slavery, they were exposing it. They wrote tomes, slavery as it is, because preachers and um, writers and authors from the South would say things like, slavery is not that bad, it doesn't really go on. And Theodore Weld would send a bunch of agents into the South to like document how many slaves were being raped, how it went down, finding secret rooms for it. And of course, there were mixed children on all the plantations. Maybe not all, shouldn't use the word all. But that, that's the concupiscence. They exposed the South as a brothel. They, they even exposed that, uh, that they were killing babies in the wombs in the South to cover up uh, the master's evil. And they sought its removal by the power of God. That's what abolitionism was to them. Simple. They were bringing the gospel, the whole gospel, 
the light and glory of Christ. That's why Christ is in the middle of the liberator, into conflict with the evil of their age. Uh, whether you're talking about like Douglas, who was not nearly as religious as William Lloyd Garrison, they were all saying and agreed upon the inconsistency of slavery and Christianity. They all considered themselves to be uh, holy warriors raised up, thank you, raised up by God for the purpose of abolishing evil. So where does abolitionism come from? Where and why do these guys just wake up in the morning and leave their careers as banisters, lawyers, leave their careers as novelists and careers as, uh, you know, cotton trade people. I mean, these people basically, like, gave up their lives to do this. They were beaten, they were hung, they were spat upon, they were called sedition. Everything that Jesus said would happen to people who followed him happened to them. But none of that stuff happened to the people who were opposing them and preaching in the pulpits across the South. You get me? They put their Christianity into practice against the evil of their age. They were persecuted for it, but they sought to correct that oppression anyway. Where did it come from? Well, I would like to read from the book that William Lloyd Garrison was studying. We know this from his letters. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 1. Incidentally, the book that I was studying two years ago while I was repenting of my apathy and alcohol and pornography and whatever else that someone could get me for. Isaiah chapter 1. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. Verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they are utterly estranged. But the Lord of hosts has not left us a few survivors. We should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Nine. There are some people here, faithful people. Verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. This is the Lord God of Israel talking to his people. His people. Not just his professing people. His people. He's talking to them. I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. This is God speaking. I hate your religious practices. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands... When you lift your holy hands higher and higher and higher, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. God, addressing his people through the prophet Isaiah, is saying, you're very religious people but your hands are full of blood. I don't want to hear your prayers. I don't want to hear your, your, your big worship things. I don't care how many best-selling books you write. I don't care how many sermons you preach. Your hands are full of blood, and I can't hear a word you're saying. Why? Because I don't want to. Verse 16. We always 
There's always the gospel. God's not, you know. So your hands are full of blood. 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. 19. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then Isaiah goes into this denunciation of the unfaithful city. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fathers, plead the widow's cause. This is what I have for you. In Micah 6, 8, we have the same sort of thing, right? He's told you, oh man, what it is good for you to do, right? Love justice and mercy. Amos 5, we have the same thing. I don't like your worship. Put away your instruments, let justice roll down. Correct oppression. We live in a nation that is full of blood. We've got issues going on like homosexual marriage, the dissolution of the family, right? Sex trafficking, slavery still goes on. This is a dark and evil place. And there are churches all over the place. Our hands are full of blood. Where do abolitionists come from? Well, I would submit that in this situation, given these circumstances, the Spirit of God, as it said in Psalms 94, 16, the Spirit of God will raise up from among His people that remnant, those true, vital Christians. Not Christians in word or in theology or in book reading or in church attendance or anything. He will not raise them up for the purpose of, of bringing justice and correcting oppression. It's those who repent. They wash themselves. They make themselves clean. They remove the evil of their deeds from before God's eyes. They cease to do it. They learn to do good. They seek justice. They correct oppression. God blesses them. This is where abolitionism comes from. And at this point, we will take a break. Mm -hmm. 